Oh, a nice clear night. The planets are out. And there is Uranus. Rarely seen, but easy to see in binoculars. And hey, everybody. Hi, I'm Stargazer Mark. Glad that you're with us today as the American Space Museum brings you Stay Star Curious today. And we're going to talk about the discovery on March 13th, 1781 of the seventh planet of the solar system, Uranus. Here's Uranus behind me and some of its moons around it there, Ariel, Miranda, Puck, all named after Shakespeare characters, okay? Uh, which is kind of an interesting thing because Uranus was discovered by an English amateur astronomer who in fact was a professional musician. And we're gonna talk about Mr. William Herschel the last person to discover by accident a planet that may have been seen many, many times by other astronomers that thought it was either a comet or they never saw it move, so they just thought it was a bright star. So um, hope glad that you're with us today. As a Stay Curious, uh, once a, a week, we try to give you some astronomy knowledge, and today being the anniversary of the birth, not the birth, the discovery, of the seventh planet in the solar system. We're going to talk about Uranus or Uranus without all the snickers and tell you why it was named that, what that name means. And uh, let's kick it off here. Thank you. Marty is working our stream labs here with the help of Connie. Thank you both for doing our program today. And they're going to kick back and learn a little bit just like you about this seventh planet that's in the sky right now. And I'm going to show you where to see it. Uh, after sunset tonight. But before we get started, we wanted to remind you all that Shuttle Fest is a big go for us. Uh, Saturday, April 15th at the Hyatt Place Hotel, where we did Shuttle Fest 1 last year. We're going to have the documentary Base to Space. All right, you're going to enjoy that. And uh, we're lining up everything right now, but it's going to be $20 admission, $15 if you register early. And all of that, those details will be launched uh, for this weekend, Friday. We'll do the press release on this April 15th event that we're looking forward to perpetuating every year. And looking forward to talking about some fabulous things about the shuttle era, like the time that it landed at the Bristol Motor Speedway. I happen to be covering that. Uh, the short runway there with the, uh, that was a, uh, Discovery coming in for a nice tight landing there. Of course, that's a uh, a photograph I took at the Great American Race there in Bristol, Tennessee, and uh, to have fun one time at a conference, we put the shuttle landing there. So, well, we're going to talk about extensively about the seventh planet in the solar system, Uranus, who happens to be the father of the sky. All right, uh, and we're going to. The uh, story behind it, uh, it being named Uranus, it wasn't called that for about two or three years after it was discovered. In fact, it was called George's Star by William Herschel in honor of King George III, uh, who was quite uh, flattered by it, I'm sure. Well, the name of Ur Ur uh, Uranus references the ancient Greek, Greek deity of the sky, okay? He was the father of Coronis, which is Saturn in Roman. He was the grandfather of Zeus, which is Jupiter in Rome. And, uh, and this is the only English name derived from Greek mythology that's one of the planets, all right? And it's, uh, in Uranus in Greek it translates into uh, or Orionis, O-U-R, in um uh, Roman, so they just kind of stuck with the Uranus, where the Roman and Greek gods are very different, like we just pointed out. Uh, Zeus is Jupiter, uh, Saturn is Kronos, uh, Ares in Greek is Mars in Roman mythology. So basically the Romans stole all the Greek mythology and renamed stuff. Uh, the correct pronunciation among astronomers is Uranus, okay, but if you say Uranus, that's okay too. But uh, let's see, uh, 
the consensus of the name was not reached until almost 70 years after the planet's discovery. All right. It was called George's star for almost a decade later. And then there was an astronomer uh, uh, named uh, Bode who suggested the name and it stuck. Now, Uranus is a very interesting Greek character because he's the sky god. All right. So the first thing created is Earth. And that is Gaia was the Greek god. And then the sky was created. Well, when Uranus was created, Gaia became her own. She bore Uranus and she became her own son's husband. All right. Such is Greek mythology. And together they had many offspring, including the 12 Titans that are shown around here. And of course, the Titans are, are, are legendary and and a lot of the, the uh, Greek heroes were the Titans, of course. Um, O-U-R-A-N-O-S, Uranus is the Roman for Uranus. Uh, it's literally the sky god. So that's an important god. And though it's panned because of the sound of Uranus uh, uh, being a, you know, a human body part in uh, doctor terminology, and this is a very important uh, sky god, okay, uh, in there. And all sorts of, of roles does he play in society. Still, the jokes happen, and, uh, uh, and some are subtle, some are blatant, okay. But uh, uh, please, not another Uranus joke, okay, is what I, 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 I say for the rest of the show, except I'll offer this, that the astronaut, uh, the uh, Astronomical Society that determines names in the solar system is considering changing the name of Uranus. And uh, they might change it to Eurectum. And maybe people will enjoy that better. Well, no more jokes. Let's look at the symbol for Uranus. It actually has, or Uranus, it actually has two symbols. The one on the left is the one you see in astrology a lot. And that is basically a planet with the H for Herschel in the middle of it. Um, it was suggested that uh, by Johann Kohler that, uh, that they proposed the right side, which was the symbol for platinum, which is the arrow, and uh, with the center, gold. All right, gold is a circle and the dot. That's the symbol for gold. And then you add the arrow and you had platinum. You also have Mars or iron in there. So the center one is kind of a, a gold platinum. And if you tilted the, the arrow off to the right, you'd have Mars without the dot in the middle of it. So, uh, But the globe with the H was to honor Sir William Herschel, who we'll talk about here in just a minute in there. So here is Mr. William Herschel. Uh, quite a notable scientist of his day, but he was actually a classical uh, pianist, and he and his sister Caroline taught lessons uh, to uh, people in orchestras, violin, the, uh, piano, oboe. He was a master at all of musical instruments, and but he was an amateur astronomer who loved astronomy and shown in the background is his giant telescope that in later years he built. And with the help of his sister, Caroline, she become an astronomer her in her own right. And her brother would be on top of this big telescope shouting down to her the observation coordinates that he was rattling off there. Now, this is all all primitive by today's technology and particularly in England where they were. Um, he, um, um, it was a hard situation to do astronomy in England, one, because the weather was so frightful, but two, um, because of, uh, the, everything was recorded, written down and quite crude how they, they kept the longitude and latitude coordinates, which are called right ascension and declination. Yet they had to be very precise uh, to get these coordinates, and they did. That's how he would discover things. Comets was how you become famous. And Caroline discovered a lot of comets in her day, 
with her brother. And that was how people got famous back in the day, was discovering comets. We talked about Charles Messier. He created a list of 100 objects that didn't move in the sky, but were faint and fuzzy looking. And that is the bedrock of the galaxies, the nebula and the star clusters that amateur astronomers hunt in their backyards. So also of note is William Herschel was the, uh, uh, gave birth to John Herschel. There's William again, and his son, John Herschel, become a, a wonderful amateur astronomer and also invented photography. Uh, he, John Herschel was William's son. He was born in 1792, just 11 years after dad discovered Uranus. Uh, he, was an, he was a mathematician, an astronomer, a chemist, a botanist, all right. His, his uh, drawings of plants and so forth are phenomenal. He invented photography and then invented the blueprint. And he's buried beside Charles Darwin in Westminster Abbey. He also wrote a lot of entries in the Encyclopedia Britannica of the 1850s, which is today's Wikipedia. If you ever wrote in, entries in Wikipedia, that's sort of what he was doing, was updating things. But let's get back to the discovery of Uranus on the night of uh, March 13th, 1781, William Herschel was in the garden of his house at 19 New King Street in Bath, Somerset, England, which is now the Herschel Museum of Astronomy. And I'll bet Robert Law up in Scotland, our dear friend of State Curious, has been there. He initially reported it as a comet and thought it was a comet as he followed its movements for over a couple months. And when he didn't see a tail uh, form, he was started to get um, uh, suspicious of it. And then by then other astronomers, particularly mathematicians had calculated its orbit and realized that he discovered a seventh planet of the solar system. His telescope that he discovered it with was just a six inch reflecting telescope, the kind that many of us backyard astronomers have. And uh, he recorded a nebulous star, perhaps a comet. Uh, and then he noted that it had that it had changed its place. And he reported his discovery to the Royal Society. And uh, But at powers of above 500, he saw that it had a diameter of a disk, which was not normal for a comet. And uh, finally, um, uh, it was deemed that it was a, another planet in the solar system, uh, beyond Saturn, and uh, it was soon universally accepted as a planet and two years later. And uh, he had the honor of calling it uh, uh, Georges Sidereus, uh, Georges Star. Now, King George was so impressed that he made Herschel a Sir, Sir William Herschel, and he gave him an annual stipend of 200 pounds back then, which would be 25,000 pounds in today's uh, money, uh, which I think a pound is two bucks. So he was given something around $50,000 a year just to be the royal astronomer in today's money. So nothing to laugh at. Now, what was he looking at? Well, back in the day of, uh, what day was this on my notes there? 1990, I guess, back in the 20s, 20s, 20th century. This is my sketches of um, Uranus when it was near a globular cluster in Sagittarius called M22. And basically the black dot at, at the lower right at the kind of five o'clock is where I saw over a series of about a week, I watched uh, Uranus move in relationship to this globular cluster, which is fun to do. I made sketches that aren't very scientific, but as you can see, my enthusiasm there, Uranus, exclamation point, uh, and watching it move over a series from June 15th to June 19th, it looks like, 1990 there. So just to inspire you that when you look at things through a telescope, you can make your own discoveries and observations and uh, wow, 32 years ago when I did that, that was fun for me to see the own motions of uh, Uranus against the backdrop of the stars. And here's a photograph 
it's not a photograph. This is how it stacks up tonight at 7.30 when it's twilight here on Daylight Savings Time. And you're out there doing a little gardening and enjoying that extra hour of daylight. Uh, Jupiter will be directly west at Venus. You're going to see Venus linger for an hour or so. Uranus is right up above Venus, between Venus and at the top is the star cluster of the Pleiades, the seven little sisters. So when you see Venus and the Pleiades, look right in the middle there, and there's Uranus. And even with binoculars and this Stellarium uh, program, or a, a program you have, I'm putting my, my, my binoculars up there to show you that you could look and see it uh, with binoculars as a bluish, greenish star. Kind of look bluish to you because that's the way the atmosphere looks like. Well, here is another picture of, uh, there we go. We go to the discoveries that we made of Uranus that we see today are based on when Voyager 2 flew by Uranus in uh, 1985, I believe was the date. I forgot to write that date down. But it was almost 200 years later to the day, uh, to the year, when it was discovered that Voyager 2 flew by at 30,000 miles an hour and took some of the, the only close-up pictures of the cloud tops that we're looking at and the nearby satellites of Saturn, which Saturn has 27 moons, all right, about five of them are larger than 100 miles in diameter, all named after characters of um, Shakespeare. Uh, and behind me here is uh, Miranda, particularly. There, uh, there's uh, Ariel, there's Puck, is a real small one, just a couple miles. Miranda at the upper right is, is very shattered. It's, it's almost like it was blown apart and glued back together. Ariel has got um, ice on its surface. Now, the surface of, it's not the surface, but the cloud tops of Uranus are very bland, all right? It's the coldest planet in the solar system. Now, here are two views of it taken by the Hubble telescope, and we're waiting for time on the Webb telescope to be queued up as there's so many astronomers using the new Webb telescope that they haven't gotten to looking at Uranus yet, and they will. But this is through the Hubble telescope, and you see through filters that that bland atmosphere has some banding to it, and it also has some electrical currents that have lightning and, and lighter areas on it. And then it has the second largest system of rings in the solar system behind Saturn. All right. Uh, these rings are composed of extremely dark uh, materials. Let's look at all those planets there again, uh, satellites around uh, uh, Uranus there in the middle. Uranus is the coldest planet in the solar system, uh, orbiting at a distance of about uh, two and a half billion, about two billion miles from the sun. Uh, it's much closer than Neptune, which averages about 4 billion miles, or uh, around 3.5 billion miles from the sun. But this doesn't help stop uh, Uranus from being colder than Neptune, which we're talking 330 below zero on the surface, to, on the top of the clouds, all right? Now, these are Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter are all clouds. Uh, they're... they're, they're, they're like a system of deep, deep, thousand-mile-thick layers of clouds with a maybe metallic core to them. Jupiter is, uh, Uranus, by the way, is very strange because it rotates on its side. That's why this picture taken by Voyager looks like a bullseye at one of its poles. So it rolls like a bowling ball down the alley with the poles are rotating off to either side of it. What knocked it over? 90 degrees from vertical? We don't know. What knocked the Earth 24 and a half degrees over from vertical? We don't know. Something knocked Mars over about 24 degrees, like the Earth. We don't know. That's why we have seasons. Something did knock it over, though. And the violence of the early solar system in its first 
half a billion years is what we suspect. And we know everything in the solar system is almost five billion years old. Uranus, by the way, so it rolls around like that. So that means that a day, this this is pointed towards the sun for, for uh, 84 day, years. It goes to take around one trip around the sun. So a, a day lasts 42 years. It gets one hemisphere warmed up, 42 years, the other hemisphere warmed up. And a day is actually like, 84 years on Mars. It's the second least dense planet. Uh, Saturn would float on water if it was in a pool big enough. Uranus would just kind of bob on up and down like a bobber. It wouldn't completely uh, be submerged. It is the second least dense. We don't know why, except the material is light on it. Its atmosphere is aquamarine color from methane. There's also traces of hydrocarbons. Uh, that are believed to result in methane reacting with solar radiation. That's why we get these colors here. Um, and of course, it was the first planet discovered in the modern age. Uh, other astronomers may have seen this planet, which is, is very interesting. Uh, of note, uh, in my notes that I researched here, is um, even back in... Um, Where's my pictures here? Even back in um, uh, 128 BC, it is imagined that Hippocras, who was one of the first people to do a star catalog, he may have recorded it as a star uh, back 100 years uh, uh, before uh, Christ, BC. Uh, John Flamstead, a, f a fam famous astronomer, recorded it six times in a catalog. Uh, in Taurus and, and, put, and said it was a star in Taurus, all right? He didn't see it move enough. And another uh, astronomer recorded it at least 12 times in his charts, but again, didn't go back to notice that it had moved. So Uranus discovered uh, on March 13, 1781, uh, 242 years ago. And yet we still make jokes about it. Oh, well, but remember, it is an important planet and is an important god of the sky, the god of the skies, planet Uranus. And can't forget about William Herschel. William Herschel went on to be one of the greatest astronomers of all time when he got paid to play, so to speak, by King George III. Uh, he abandoned his uh, career as a musician and teaching music and uh he created a catalog of over 400 objects that he got the coordinates of this expanded Messier's list of nebulas and galaxies and star clusters that Messier recorded over a hundred well charles uh, uh, or william herschel recorded over a thousand of them and another one is the, the herschel 400 list that a lot of us do Steve Hammer, you're out there watching. I got your email, and thank you for your pictures. Steve was photographing the launch uh, scrub up there at um, uh, in Virginia. Mark UCX watching. Gary Gerald, Doug Forrest, enjoyed talking to Doug over the weekend. William Whiting's watching in Michigan. Larry Pusker is another Michigander up there. Tom UCX watching. Dave Stange, Chris Callie, and Daniel Azaridi's watching. Hello to all you folks, and I hope that you enjoyed getting your week started with a little bit of knowledge about the seventh planet of the solar system, Uranus. There it is again from the Hubble telescope in a superimposed image. This is what its, its rings look like if we could see them in a telescope, though they're very dark. They're still the second most complex rings behind those complex ones of Saturn on there. So it reminds you all to get out and look at Uranus tonight, right between Venus and the Pleiades, right in the middle there. I guarantee it, you might, if you had a star, a star chart, you can see a, a, a star that is kind of greenish or bluish green, aquamarine we'll call it, that is Uranus. So we've got a question. Yeah, my question, Mark, are the rings similar to the rings of Saturn, same composition? That's a nice, that's a good question. Uh, we don't know for sure because, uh, but uh, they're darker. Uh, 
And now they're further away from Saturn, which is about a billion miles away from the sun. This is almost three billion miles away from the sun. So you'd have a lot of faintness there. They're smaller. And uh, one of the things about rings, Marty, is we don't know if they were the remains of a small moon that got too close and was torn apart at what we call the Roach limit, or were they debris left over from the formation of these other smaller moons there? We do know the makeup of Saturn's rings are ice and rock, and there's a lot of water in, the, in them because of the Cassini mission that orbited for 12 years, did a lot of data on them. With Voyager 2 whizzing by in the 1980s, it literally just had a few minutes of data to grab so good question, but we don't know for sure what those rings are made of and why they're so dark and small, but science will tell us more and that's why we explore. Good question, Marty. Hazel Banks is watching. Hmm? Hazel, Banks is watching. Hazel Banks is watching. Of course, Hazel, glad to see you out there staying curious. The rest of the week, Hazel, we're going to talk about women in the space program. We're going to feature that there are three directors of the three major space centers of NASA, and they're all women in Marshall, Johnson, and Kennedy Space Center. We're going to find out who they are. Wish I could bring them on our Stay Curious program. We've efforted that, but we're not a big enough boys yet, I think, to get that at their attention. But we will one day. But we'll tell you about those three center directors of NASA that are women. We're going to talk about astronauts. We're going to feature in March the month of women, some of the achievements of astronauts and the business side of women in space. So we're glad that you're all with us today. I am so proud of our museum here at the American Space Museum. We had a great group of people in here all week long because of the launches, that 3D satellite, uh, 3D rocket brought in a lot of new people into our museum to see that. So we're looking forward to seeing you all here soon. So until tomorrow, when we bring you some more Stay Curious and Space History, and we got a pretty big birthday tomorrow I'm going to tease you with, okay? In fact, the birthday tomorrow is the oldest living astronaut, period. Who is it? Stay tuned and stay curious. I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you soon to bridge the space between us.